everyone. I'm Katie Neal Rizzo. This is Julie Barbarisa. And we're here from the uh, One Norwood campaign. We are um, missing two other people from our campaign. Uh, Sarah Quinn is one of our co-chairs, and then Denise Kiley is our treasurer. Um, they're both working today, but Julie and I both work from home, so we're able to join you to try to get some information out to you about the override that's on the ballot for Monday, June 3rd, and answer some of your questions. We also brought along with us a few um, experts that we thought um, might be helpful in getting some of your questions answered. We have Maya Bodenhofer at the end. She's the chair of the school committee. Alan Slater is the um, recently now former chair of the finance commission. And um, her. and uh, Bill Plasco is on the board of selectmen. And then we also have Bob Griffin um, who is now retired former principal of the Callahan and longtime teacher in Norwood. Um, Norwood, uh, One Norwood is a um, ballot question committee we officially formed with the state and we are trying to get information out to the residents to um, get a guest vote on the uh, ballot question on June 3rd. We are a group of residents who believe that in order to continue to thrive and succeed in Norwood as a community, we need to pass an override of the Proposition 2.5 tax law. Um, we were recently, as of last night, the League of Women Voters has um, voted to endorse a yes vote on the campaign. Um, so who put together the override package? Um, it wasn't, we weren't the ones who put together the override package. The Budget Balancing Committee, which is a committee made up of members of the scope committee, Finance Commission, Board of Selectmen, the town manager, the town accountant, and the superintendent. They've been meeting over the last 10 months and going over numbers. They've put together a number based on a five-year projections of needs for both the schools and general government. And the override package was unanimously sent to the Board of Selectmen to be put on a ballot for June 3rd. Why does Norwood need an override? Um, the Massachusetts state law limits the amount uh, uh, that towns can raise taxes to 2.5% a year plus the impact of new growth. And inflation and some costs like health insurance for town employees and special education has increased more than 2.5% a year. So our inflation is outpacing the amount we're able to uh, raise. And now 80% of the towns and cities in Massachusetts have already passed at least one override and um, because they also face the same gaps that we face between the amount of money they can raise in taxes and rising costs. So how will the override affect residents? Yeah. Sorry for all the technical difficulties. We did put together a PowerPoint uh, presentation which will hopefully be available shortly. Um, but in the meantime, um, most of you might be aware that this year the school committee um, was faced with a significant deficit and they had to make some really hard choices. They're going to be closing the Willett School, which is where the entire district's um, about 290 kindergartners go, and those kids will have to next year move to the already overcrowded elementary schools. Um, they eliminated all after-school sports, including varsity sports and football, um, after-school activities such as marching band, all the music and drama activities after school. They are laying off 12 teachers district-wide, um, which leads to increased class sizes. Um, and over the next five years, it is projected that they will have to lay off, the town will have to lay off police, fire, library, DPW staff. They are delaying maintenance for a lot of our roads, which will lead to more potholes and poorer quality roads. Um, and in the next five years, they're going to have to start cutting town services, such as reducing hours at the um, Winter Street Composting and Recycling Center, um, and closing Father Max Pool. Hopefully we'll have our, our slides up in a second. Um, how will this affect your taxes? Um, that's the big question that we've been getting. It depends on how much your house is assessed at. The average house was assessed at um, $450,000. Um, you can see it actually, there's a graph on the back of the flyer that shows you, you know, you can look at your own assessed value and what that increase would be. So for the average homeowner in Norwood, it would be about $389.
And at the bottom of the flyer, you can see Norwood's average tax bill compared to all of our surrounding towns. So on the left, you can see Norwood's current tax bill is well under the state average. And even with this override, we will still be below the state's average. And if you look over to the right, you can see other towns like Canton, Dedham, Walpole, we will all be, or we will still be well below um, a lot of our neighbors. So hopefully this is coming up. Now, maybe not. How this will directly affect seniors, um, a compromised school district can affect home value. Families aren't gonna move to a neighborhood with bad schools. Um, unfortunately, I actually, my daughter's friends decided to sell their house and then move into Walpole, which was a really sad thing for my daughter. And um, we, I have another friend who has a house on the market now. Um, as this budget deficit continues to grow, the services available to all residents will de decrease. There's been talk of a trash fee that hopefully won't come to pass, but different fees may increase around town. Um, hours of operations to town offices could decrease. Like I said before, the town dump could reduce its hours so it's only open once a week. And we're online with our presentation finally. Yay! Yay. Um, okay. Uh, how, if education is not prioritized in town, what kind of residents are we attracting? What kind of families will want to move to Norwood? Um, we compile the full list of all the cuts that are on stake at our, uh, that are at stake on our website, onenorwood.com. Um, and then a lot of people say, oh, seniors can't afford this. And we're concerned about that too. So we spend a lot of time with the town assessor trying to figure out all of the different tax breaks and exemptions that are available, available for seniors. We have a handout that lists all of them. Um, and we also um, have links on our website to all the different programs that are available. And where can you find more information? There's more information. Um, the town will be hosting two different informational sessions um, at the high school, Thursday, May 9th at 7 o'clock, and Saturday, May 11th at 9.30 in the morning. Those are the same presentations, just two different times, so everybody can catch it. And then we have more information, including frequently asked questions, on our website at onenorwood.com. And then we have a two-minute explainer video that explains why we think this, um, why the override is needed for Norwood. So we're going to try to plug that in, but while we um, are getting that to work, um, we can start taking some questions because I found that a lot of people have had questions. We've met with a lot of different groups around town, um, and we brought these experts to answer some questions. So if anybody wants to start by, uh, um, with a question. Should I bring the mic around? It's like a three-part of you. You're talking about an override of uh, 5.1 million, uh, is that right? 5.95. Uh, all right. That override, once we have it, it's here forever, right? Yes. All right. Phil, Phil if I might. Yep. The, the, short, the short answer is we tend to say that it's forever because it is a permanent increase in our tax levy ability to tax. But um, it's not permanent if the vote is choose for it not to be, because there is such a thing as an underwrite that can then, if there's a time in the future when we think it's not necessary and we don't want it to be there, we don't want town meeting to have the ability to raise it, you can do an underwrite and bring it down. And also, it increases the tax levy uh, limit 
but it doesn't mean that we have to spend to it. But if there's a permanent approval to expend to spend that high, yes. But the other part of that I wanted to ask, you're talking about the override. We haven't even found out what our reevaluation is on the houses yet, have we? That's going to be another tax increase. Well, that's um, that happens every year. I understand that. So you just got the current ones. You just got next year's. We won't know until next year. The evaluation that, that you might be referring to that's being done now, the re uh, looking at your houses all over again, trying to come in, the assessors are doing. That's required by state law every three years, and that, therefore they'll make an adjustment if the records they've been keeping haven't kept pace with the market. So, but but your increase happens every year. And the evaluation of your house is not your taxes. Your taxes are what town meeting spends, and then what the selectmen vote, whether we'll have a single tax rate or a split between residential and commercial. And then whatever we choose to happen there, the math has to add up to the expending. So your tax rate and your tax bill are two different things. And your appraisal is only one part of the component to, to get to that. Your actual tax burden is determined by the vote of town meeting as to what we're going to spend on operating the town. And I think Maya has uh, something else to add to that. I just want to add to that a little bit. The, um, can, you okay. can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to add to that a little bit. The, I think it's confusing when we talk about this reevaluation and we think that, well, if everybody's home goes up by 10%, doesn't that mean that all of the tax revenue goes up by 10%? And that would be logical, but that's not how the state does this. And so the way it works is we have a limit that we can only go increase by 2.5% every year plus new growth. So if everybody's um, home value in town doubled in a year, our tax revenue would not double. It would only go up by 2.5%, which means that everybody's tax rate would have to go way down. And so when you think about, you know, I've seen, well, isn't this revaluation going to give us more money? It actually doesn't. It may change for individual people because it may be that one neighborhood has a slightly increased value relative to another one, but if the whole town goes up, if it doubles, that just absolutely does not double the amount of tax revenue coming in. Did you have another question? I do. The, um, the other thing is we have another, we're talking about another override later on for the new school. Possibly, yes. Where the hell do they think the seniors are going to get the money to do it? Yeah. We are looking at um, potentially building a new middle school. We, the timeline shows that uh, we would be looking for um, approval to go forward with that. Uh, the earliest we would possibly be doing that would be spring of 2021, which would be two years from now. We would be looking for approval for funding for the whole building. And then construction would begin about a year later, and then the bills would start coming in after that. So it's a few years out. Yeah, but we're still paying for the high school. We are. So, I mean, I don't understand it. You're talking about the different towns and what they got as compared to what we got. If you're talking about Westwood, their land capacity is much more than ours. Dedham's farther ahead than us. We don't have the room for anything else in this town. All we're doing now is building uh, low-income housing. And we're the ones that are paying for that too, as far as I can see. Now, my tax bill in 2000 was $3,042. My tax bill this past year was $5,880. So people say it's, it's only going up a little bit. Every little bit hurts to the seniors. We're not making the money you people are. You people are working for a living and you're making good money and good luck to you. But the seniors aren't doing it. We're, we're retired. So I, I don't see how you can uh, say it's, it, you know, I understand what you're talking about, but I, and I, this isn't a slam. But for the last five years or so, I've heard the school committee complain every single year. We're going to lay off this, we're going to lay off that, we're going to lay off this. And over the five years, they didn't. In fact, I read an article in the paper a few weeks ago about uh, the 30-odd uh, teachers that were going to lay off. 
in the last 10 years, I guess it is, and I guess they haven't laid them off. That's actually not true that we haven't made layoffs. In fact, this year's school budget, our budget for library books is zero dollars. We weren't able to buy a single li pay for a single library book this year because our schools are so strapped for money. We did make reductions in our staff last year. I don't remember the final number. I think we had four reductions in staff. We reduced by four last year. Um, and I, I do understand the concern that every year we have talked about, oh, there's going to be a lot of cuts, and then it turns out that it's it gets better, right? And I, I, I before I was on the school committee, that made me crazy too. I completely understand that concern. Some of that had to do with how we go about this process. We start the process in January, and we try to make estimates, and we make conservative estimates then of how much money might be available, and. Then as the year progresses, in, in the end of January, we start to get information about the governor's budget. In April, we get information about what the house budget will look like. In, Fe in February, we get information about what health insurance rates might be. So the process moves on and we start to get a better sense of how much money would be available. And in that case, we have changed our projections about how much would be available and what cuts will need to be made. I will say that last year and this year, the school committee has made a concerted effort not to do the scare tactics. We have not announced any cuts that we didn't actually have to go forward with. And the budget as it is now has been approved. The town meeting books are going to print. Things are not expected to change. Let me ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. out, of the, out of this tax increase, what's the amount going towards salaries as compared to the schools? Well, I'm not sure how we divide what salaries for salaries for the teachers as compared to uh, items for the school, for books or whatever they need up there. What's the difference? I don't have that broken out in that way, but I will tell you that there are there are certain things that we are definitely doing. We are talking about um, about a half a million dollars in curriculum and instructional supplies and things like that. Um, about $750,000 to fund all of the after school programs. But you could argue that that goes to salaries because some of that goes to teach, to pay coaches and things like that. That's not what I meant. I, I said the difference between the salaries that are going to go to the money that's going to go to the teachers and the money that's going to be spent within the school for school for the kids. Well, I would argue that when we hire a teacher to teach the students, that that money is going towards the kids. But I, as I said, I just, I don't have it broken out in terms of how much is terms of salary and how much is other things. Well, if that was broken out, I think the people in the town would like to hear it. I'm so happy to get an answer to that question. So in the, override pack, in the override package, we're hiring an additional 12, 12 teachers. But then some would otherwise be laid off. And no. then how there's, many additional there's teachers? Nine teachers who would otherwise be laid off, mm -hmm. plus an additional 12 teachers. Okay. And the are you asking if the override money is going to be given to the teachers for salary increases? That's right. Oh, salary increases is a different question. I think he wants to know if the override money is being used to give teachers salary increases. Teachers contractually get a 2.5% salary increase for this next fiscal year. And so some of the override money would cover that increase. Just the contractual increases. Right. We have our video working now with sound, so we're going to quick play that, and then we're going to um, continue to take questions. My role needs an override. Since the passage of Proposition 2 and a half in 1980, Massachusetts towns and cities have been limited in how much they can annually increase property taxes to 2.5%. Some costs, like health insurance and special education services, have increased by more than 2.5% each year. This creates a structural deficit as town expenses consistently exceed revenue. Norwood has been making sacrifices for years to balance the budget, but we've also consistently relied on our town savings, a practice that will eventually leave those savings completed. To balance the budget without using Norwood savings, the school committee and general government will have to make significant cuts. For the next year, the school committee has voted to eliminate all after-school activities, including middle and high school clubs, fine arts groups, and sports. The Willett School will be closed, and at least nine teaching positions will be cut. 
Each year, the projected deficit grows, and cuts will continue over the coming years, reaching into the general government side with police officers, firefighters, DPW, and library staff layoffs. Town services will be cut, and operating hours at facilities, such as the Winter Street Composting and Recycling Center, will be decreased. The solution? An operational override. An operational override is a town-wide ballot question that allows the town to increase taxes more than 2.5%. Nearly 80% of towns in Massachusetts have already passed at least one operational override. Norwood has not. The proposed override will set Norwood up for a stable financial future by better funding the true costs of budget breakers, like road maintenance and snow and ice removal. It will fix our town's budget issues for the foreseeable future and allows Norwood to continue to offer needed services for residents and a good education for our children. Be sure to vote yes on June 3rd. Okay, we're going to continue to take questions. Did I I have a question in regards to seniors in Norwood. We have here a beautiful senior center, which there are many, many uses uh, that are offered to us to enjoy. How directly would it, uh, if the override did not go through, would it affect the senior center and the budget that's been presented to you uh, to the town, and also how would it affect the seniors in general in the town itself? So I'm gonna answer one specific point that I think has um, come to light that I think affects a lot of seniors and low-income um, people in town, and that's the elimination of the transfer program, which would be on the cutting block for next year, uh, if over it doesn't pass. The transfer program is the program that allows for free and low, um, low fare cab use for seniors across town, and that would no longer be funded. Yeah, I'd just elaborate that the immediate effect as we prepared next year's budget would have no significant effect whatsoever on the senior center. After that, the town general government, if we don't get the override, if we don't get additional funds, we're foreseeing over the next few years having to cut about a million and a half dollars out of our operating budget to reduce services because we won't have the money. So far, the only outlook for those few years and that million five has been done by the general government. And he's pretty much left the senior services alone except for the transfer program. However, that's just the view he has put out. I have a copy of it here. Uh, in balance, we have to go back and forth and have a town-wide consensus. So could the senior center be subject to um, some losses? Yes, I'm not threatening that because right now we're not planning to. But we do have to come up with a consensus. And just for example, some of the examples are the public uh, safety, police and fire, cutting out $300,000 worth of services from those departments. Well, it could be that somebody says, I don't want to lose a policeman and fireman. Guess what? We spent $350,000 in salaries up at the senior center. Let's close it. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm sure that would be our lowest priority. But those are the kind of things the town is going to have to decide. One, one issue or another, and where do we make the cuts? Right now, there is no intention to take anything out of the senior center. Okay, um, next question. Yeah, you said that taxes can't go up for more than two and a half percent. My taxes last year went up five percent. Yeah. The, before that, at least one year went up ten percent. Yeah. Right. So I don't believe you when you say that, unless you're talking about the total two and a half of the whole town. Then why am I getting my burden is two five percent, and somebody else must be going down? Yes. Uh, I mean, you are correct. Uh, the. Uh, when we talk about uh, Proposition 2.5, you know, essentially what the law says is the total tax burden for the entire community can go upwards no more than 2.5% in any given year. So if we, let's say we collect uh, $100 million of taxes in a given year, then the following year we can only collect another $2.5 million in addition to that. However, you know, there are a lot of different factors which go into uh, how much you or I actually get charged uh, in our taxes. And it's not only the total tax levy, you know, which again only goes up to two and a half percent, 
but it depends on the split between uh, residential and commercial, because that changes every year. I know when the selectmen do it, they try to do it in such a way that it minimizes the impact on individuals. Um, what your house evaluation is, because as Maya have noted, when you do a reevaluation, my house may go up more, your house may go up a little bit less. Um, so, I mean, you're correct in saying that your taxes can certainly go up, you know, more than two and a half percent a year. But what that also means is that the taxes of the person sitting next to you may have gone down, you know, uh, uh, somewhat or gone up less than two and a half percent. Okay. Next. If I could, if I could oh. just add to that a little bit. The the state law, the proposition two and a half, is not really exactly two and a half either. It's two and a half percent of the last year's tax base. But also added to that is any new growth. So if a new corporations uh, built a new headquarters, if a four more, ten more homes were just built in town, that evaluation gets added, and that allows the tax revenue to go up a little bit too. And then, as uh, Alan was referring to, each of our individual circumstances change with our property. When you're talking about property taxes, if I put on a ditch in my house and the value goes up or if the value just goes up because of reevaluation based on sales, how well uh, sales are going in the town, if everybody's house is considered to have more value, then that will affect your bottom line, and it could be more than two and a half. But ultimately, there's a math formula for how much the town can just, on its own, raise the revenue, and that's based on that formula of two and a half percent plus new growth. And also added to that is, uh, any overrides like the uh, high school is in that formula also. So all of that would actually be more than 2.5% on your personal <coughs> bill. But the overall levy capacity from one year to another cannot exceed the 2.5%. How many, how long will that 2.5% last? Increase. So you, what you're saying is going to go from 25 to 5% increase every year? No. Now we say the five percent might be your individual service. No, I'm talking about you're saying we're going to do a two and a half percent override. How much over two and a half percent are we talking? And how long is it going to last? Uh, on, well, let me put it this way: on on the average home, which is four hundred and thirty-nine thousand dollars the tax bill would go up about $389. Yeah, but for how long? How many years? Forever. 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 That's, your new that's your new tax base. So we're, we're if, about, if, as, as I said, as as I said earlier, going to get that money. As I said earlier, if we choose the town, town meeting approves it. If you pass the override, that increases how much the town can, can possibly spend. The actual spending is still determined by town meeting. Is they there, still have to appropriate the expenditure. Is there a limit over the two and a half percent that you can override? Um, or can you go up anywhere? No, because that's that's the choice of the voters. So no, we, but we can't. They give you an override, but how much can, is that override? Voters can increase as much as they want to. But the the ballot question is for five point nine five million dollars. That's right. the total yeah, how amount. How much percentage that? What percentage the is that? What percentage is that? I, I'm hearing nine percent. Yeah, I'm about nine percent. So it's going to be five, nine, and nine to ten percent forever. Just no, it's nine percent that first not every year. year. Just the one time. It'll go up nine percent next you year, it was and then two point five percent again every year after that. It so we take a one year bump. It it'll probably increase about nine percent next year. And then from that point on, it'll continue at the 2.5% every year after that because of Pro Proposition 2.5%. So the override minutes. is only for one year? No, it's a one-time bump. It'll take us up to a higher limit. And then from that limit, we start. We continue again at that 2.5% a, a year. Yeah, I understand that. Once you get up to that point, right. then you go from there to 2.5%. Correct. But that's not what you said. You said it's going to be an override every year. The big, the big yeah. Take the mic. The big hit is that first year. Not, see, but that's not what you explained. At least I didn't hear it. I was working but back there. It goes from here to here, but then it stays there all the way. It never goes back down. It stays up there. That's why we say it's forever, because it stays at that level. 
Yeah, but the override is going to be two and a half. I mean, the, the, the percent increase after that is going to be only two and a half percent. Yes. All right. We only go over two and a half percent one year, and then after that we continue on. Well, you get this different base. Right. Exactly. Right. It's different base. Right. Um, any other questions? <coughs> I, I have two questions, uh, two statements and then a question. The first one is, the town never seems to say no to anything, uh, school committee, any of the other departments, when they go for their budget. No one says no. My second comment is, I have to live within my budget. I couldn't go to my next door neighbor and say, hey, would you give me like $300 for a new sofa because I think I want one? And my, my question is, the school department, I thought I heard once that it's teachers who do lunch duty. Is that correct? Um, teachers do assist with lunch duty in most of the schools, um, and there are in some of the schools there are parent volunteers, and in most of the schools, some of the administrators are also in the lunchroom. So when they're doing lunch duty, are they getting paid the salaries that they are as administrators or teachers? So administrators are paid a flat salary for the entire day, and so if they choose to spend part of their day um, in the, the lunchroom, then that's how they're spending part of their day, but then they're, that doesn't reduce the amount of work they often they do, so they all stay after school and continue to do their work. Um, for the teachers, there is, um, as part of their contract, uh, there is a, so, Everyone who works at least six hours at a stretch by state law is guaranteed a half an hour break, right? That's, a, that's not just teachers, that's everyone. And so teachers are guaranteed a half an hour break. If they opt to not use their half hour break and instead um, supervise the lunchroom during that time, then they are compensated for that time. That has to be a voluntary thing, otherwise we'd be in violation of state law. Um, and, but if we, we could ask them to supervise the lunchroom without additional compensation, but if we did that, we would have to give them another half an hour break during the day. So we're basically getting an extra half an hour of teaching time out of that teacher because they're giving up their break to supervise the lunchroom. See, my, my concern is the town is thinking about saving millions of dollars. Sometimes you have to start with like 10,000, or fifty thousand dollars to bring the budget down for the town. Yes. If I might uh, add a comment to Mary's uh, question and point that she made at the beginning, <coughs> nobody ever says no. That's absolutely incorrect. Every year, department heads are asked to show us what they need to provide the services to the town and what they need in the departments. They're usually. Uh, three, at least uh, on average, what, about three million dollars more than we can expend because we have to have a balanced budget. We can't go over that two and a half unless it's so serious that we're coming and asking for an override like what's happening this year. So every year we have to take those requests and say no until we get down to a balanced budget. We have to do trade-offs like we were talking about earlier. Will it be police or will it be the senior center? We have to do those kind of trade-offs every single year. And several years ago, probably what, almost 20 years ago now, the state aid that we received that we balance it, pays for a good chunk of our town budget every year, the state seriously cut it down. And every town in the Commonwealth has been spending its savings accounts. And that's how we've been getting by every year. But now those are done. They're gone. We've used them up. And we still have these increased expenses. So now we're at a point that we're either going to have to have the people say they're willing to pay for the services we have, or maybe even more services, or we're going to have to lose serv cut those services and not provide them. Um, so it's a choice we have to make, whether we're willing to spend a little more to have what we already have and maintain it, or even increase it, or are we willing to accept without those services? Do you not want to have your trash picked up? But guess what, if you don't have your trash picked up, it still has to be picked up, so you're gonna pay out of your other pocket. So if it doesn't come out of your tax pocket, it's gonna come out of your personal expenses. So there's no easy answer. It's not uh, very comforting to have to ask people to dig deeper 
but it's your choice what level of services you want. You can't have services if you don't pay for it, there's a cost. And we've hit the limit of all the different resources we have. Our resources are very limited by state law, and we just, we're just there, right? That our backs into the wall. Thank you. Um, and I would just wanted to add on to it. Um, as far as people never telling the school committee no, um, we used to offer art at the kindergarten level. We used to offer Italian language at the high school. That does not happen anymore. Last year, um, a lot of the teachers that retired were not replaced, so we didn't feel it as a cut because we weren't actually laying off people, but. We could feel it in our own, my kids go to the old town, and um, the third grade teacher, Mrs. Barnacle, who you know taught for many, many years, when she retired, she was not replaced. So you know my kids' class size went up by about eight students the following year because there were fewer teachers. Um, Leah had a question? I, I, um, when I pay, when I do my taxes, is the, is the uh, uh, is, the, is the tax we're talking about on my house deductible? Yes. So if my tax, my my house tax goes up by three hundred fifty dollars a year, and I'm deducting my um, it as a tax deduction, so I say fifteen percent, uh, I'm getting back right. That's off my tax bill. I'm not going to offer tax advice. I'm not. <laughs> I'm sorry. But particularly, but particularly, I'm not going to offer tax advice, particularly with the recent changes. Right, right. Uh, and there's limits now to what you can ten thousand dollars, I think, to what you can right. what you can claim. So it depends on your personal circumstances. On a simple basis, what you're saying is true, but it's a very individual circumstances that are going to apply. So we can't make a broad statement on that. All right, so the other thing is, um, you know, I'm living on my Social Security, uh, you know, I've got a small retirement as a state employee, um, and uh, I, you know, things are tight for me. Um, now, I understand if my tax increase is $350, is there some place I can go and work for the town and have some of that, um, uh, you know, forgiven for, like, working at, you know, father, the, the pool, yeah, wives and kids at the pool still open? There is a senior tax work off program in the town, and seniors can work at, um, I think it's 1250 an hour uh, for 62, 62 and a half hours a year for a credit towards there. It's, um, yeah, $750 limit a year that you can use to work, work off towards your tax, towards your tax bill. Um, and that's done through the Human Resources Department. Last year, only six seniors participated in that program. There was a seventh, but he did not complete all the hours. He only worked off $125 towards his tax bill. So I think it's a program that can definitely be used more. Uh, if the um, override goes passes and we have higher taxes, would the selectmen make available you know, some uh, volunteer coordinator who could come up to the senior center and help people sign up for, uh, you know, get the taking a break, but working for some of that tax increase on the property tax? Yeah, the, the, sen the senior work off program that you're just speaking about is run through our human resource department and they'd be more than willing to come up and uh, have different sessions and help people that are interested in that program understand it and make the application for it. Okay, I saw a bunch of questions in the middle row. As a senior, I was wondering, have any of you thought of freezing our taxes at what they are instead of increasing them when you reach a certain age? I think I think Carrie's actually working on something with um, the Sudbury bill, trying to push that to legislation. Um, I, I believe so through the Mass Council on Aging. Do you want to speak to that? It's not COVID specific, so I want to speak on okay. through the Mass Council on Aging. But we are trying, I actually just had a, a talk with Bill um, about trying to get some um, programs in. Special town meeting, we are having a um, donation box. But we, okay. the, the, the freezing of taxes and that type of thing is controlled by state law and not by the selectmen. There's only certain things we can do to raise revenue, and there's only certain things we can do to reduce revenue. And usually the state approves different programs. 
to succeed here with the different kind of tax breaks that are yeah. already approved by the town of Howard and they have to go to town meeting and pr approve them. They're usually what they call local option and therefore town meeting has to approve them. There's one that I found out today uh, that I was ignorant of that we don't have, which is a senior uh, a widow's uh, write-off and we're going to look into that and see if we can get that on a fall town meeting warrant so that that's one more choice added to this list um, and there's other efforts underway statewide to get some additional breaks and we can support those but we have no control over those that's a state legislature that has to enact those these are all great and i and i do the work off one and i and it's great but my point is I'm just a little bit over on everything else, so I can't receive any of this. And it's not that much. I, again, it's state law. Uh, we can try to get the law changed, but the legislature <laughs> has to change that to affect the entire state. We, on our own, could, can sympathize all we want, but we can't do a thing about it at the local level. Oh, it's scary. <coughs> it is, it's scary for, yeah. as, a, as a young a uh, young family in Norwood. I have three children, nine, seven, and four, and we run our own business. And we get no break on health insurance ourselves. We pay full out of pocket on our health insurance. Um, and then I have prescriptions, two hundred fifty dollars a month. I mean, we are prescription poor. Yeah. It's it is scary. It's scary for us too. It's not just the seniors that are scared, but it's also a matter of whether or not our kids are going to be able to get an education through here. I can't afford to send my kids to private school. It would be great if I could. I really believe in public schools and experiencing kids from all different demographics and all different income levels, and I wanna keep my kids in the public schools. And it's scary to know that, my, that their education is being compromised, and I'm not really sure what else to do. This isn't a one. This is not a one-year pro, um, problem either. This is something that compounds every year. The school district budget deficit is compounded by six hundred thousand dollars each year. So this year it was two point four million dollar deficit. Next year it would be three million dollar deficit. The following year three point six million. It gets worse and worse every year. And because Norwood has never done an operational override, we've not been able to catch up since Prop two and a half passed and 80% of the other towns and cities in Massachusetts have done at least one to catch up. So we fall further and further behind the eight ball every year and our schools are suffering. But I do, I, I do know it's scary and I do sympathize. I, I'm in the same boat financially. I've seen you with your hand up a couple times. There you go. Hi, <clears throat> my question is, <clears throat> excuse me, is all the new housing coming into this town? And I think that uh, is, Part of the problem. Uh, I don't know how many are, are apartments or uh, condos, and I know you'll be collecting taxes from them, but also we're going to have an influx of children, more, more than likely, and this is going to cause more problems in the future. And I think we'll still be getting increases. Well, I yeah, what if I mean, I know a lot of people have concerns over um, over the uh, number of apartments which have uh, uh, been built in over that over the last few years. Oh, can't hear me. So again, I know a lot of people have had concerns about the number of apartments, and you know there are reasons you know to like or not like apartments. That's that's a whole other argument. But in terms of children, it's been I think it's been shown in Norwood as well as nationally that one or two bedroom apartments contribute very few children uh, to, to a school system. And I remember doing the, the study when we did the uh, New Norwood High School a little over 10 years ago, and our national studies would show that, that the apartments themselves contribute very few kids. What really does contribute kids to a school system are not the apartments, but the three or four bedroom single homes. And if you look specifically at Norwood, at a couple of the developments, uh, I believe the Norwood Crossing development, and you know, the, I'm not going to guarantee the numbers are exact, but I believe in Norwood Crossing, uh, which is uh, over 100 condos, that uh, it's only one child uh, is going to, uh, to the Norwood system. To the Upland Woods uh, development, 
Um, I believe the number is 20 kids, but those are 20 kids distributed over all grade levels, so they haven't had any impact at all. Uh, so are there, are there a few more kids with apartments? <coughs> Absolutely. But do they contribute significant number of kids that have exacerbated the problem? Uh, the evidence is that they haven't. Just I want to add to that, if I might, that um, the, I think the number might be 22 kids at Upper Woods, but that's out of 260 units up there. Uh, apartments, sometimes we don't like apartments, some of us, because um, of the density they cause and maybe some other perceptions. But from a revenue perspective, they are a plus for the town. We gain more revenue out of there than we expend the town services. So all of us benefit a little bit to put towards the rest of our budget to so keep our own rates down. They actually are revenue positive. The other thing I want to mention about departments that was mentioned earlier by my good friend Bill, all the low-income housing and all. I don't know of any low-income housing being built in Norway. These house complexes even being built now, you know, one bedroom is between 1900 and 2200 a month. A two bedroom is like 22 to 2500 a month. And they go up from there. The, uh, I just was in another a complex doing an inspection on a unit uh, last week. It's a one bed, a two bedroom unit, and the rent is two thousand six hundred sixty nine dollars. They are not low income apartments. There's, there's co large complexes being built in town, and we may have uh, um, biases against them for different reasons. But please, they are not low income housing at any matter stretch of the imagination. I just wanted to um, add one thing in that we did not mention in the presentation. The override does not affect any seniors living in housing, in senior housing in town. The senior housing um, will see no, no tax increase, obviously, because they don't pay property taxes, but they will feel the cuts. Okay, next question. What about the uh, medical um, facility up on, um, by the polo way that's you know, the stand? Yes, I can't think of the name of it. Not like the right? Yeah. That's not a medical facility. Well, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. That and the, um, the um, open space that the car dealers are using for nothing. I know that's got to go before the state, before you people can get any uh, revenue from it. But that's a disgrace to the town and all that we let something like that come in like that. That they can park the cars without charging without getting the fee being charged to them. You can't park five cars in your own driveway, never mind that. But I was wondering how much money we're getting from the uh, one up in the, that place up there. And when Norwood Hospital, when Karen's went uh, uh, public, we got a million dollars the first year in taxes. What are we doing? This is the money, as soon as we get it, we seem to spend it. We, got, we find something to spend it on, we're never saving anyway. Yeah, the Norwood Hospital came in years ago, I think it was around 800000 or so, that we received the new revenues that year. But again, over time, we've inflation, pay increases, cost of doing business goes up every year, and that was just one year where we didn't have to, remember I mentioned earlier, every year we not only know it, but every time the commonwealth, but having to use its savings accounts because of the reduction in state aid. So that year we took a little less, but that's that one year. Then that's in your base now, and you're still going forward every year trying to make up. So it helped us greatly, but it certainly didn't solve the problem. It's just made it a little easier. We might have been asking for this override last year, the year before, if we hadn't gotten that. But eventually, inflation still catches up, and it doesn't solve the problem. It only helps along the way. I believe Norwood um, averages about $900,000 a year in new growth. That's just the new things like when the hospital became um, private, when we have the new things like Moderna and all of the other new developments in town, it's about $900,000 uh, a year on average. Any other questions? How much new revenues do you expect from the, uh, the houses that are being built in Lenox Street? And, and what did you? What bump did you get from the ones that up one? That's a huge development. You must be getting a, a lot of money from that. Yeah, um, I haven't seen the assessments on that, 
but we did have some prospectus when they were talking about uh, building the development, and I think it was in the neighborhood of $300,000, $325,000 we were expecting out of the one up on Woods apartment complex. So Which you know, $300,000 when the schools are facing a $2.4 million deficit with $600,000 more every single year, $300,000 is a great help, but it doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't seem like a whole lot. As was mentioned earlier, on average every year we do about nine, and um, that's still just helping us keep keep up. It, one year you can't just point to one source of money and say, "Oh, that's great," because the expenses are going up too, and we count on them like the new growth. We count on every year, so that's just part of the formula every year. Unless we can get that nine to become twelve, it doesn't really help us. It only helps us stay level in our expenditures. If next year, instead of new growth being a nine, it was only five, we'd have an even worse budget problem and would have to make cuts somewhere in services. Okay, more questions? It's not really a question, it's just a statement that we really owe it to our kids if you're cutting languages, if you're cutting extracurricular activities, this is some of the stuff that colleges look at. And if you have kids applying for college and they don't have the sufficient background and the sufficient education, then they're gonna lose out. So then what happens to the future? It goes down the drain. So we owe it to our kids to have a decent school system because that, that will also impact the value of the town. As has been mentioned, poor school system, Families move to other towns, and it's already been known. And I have a friend who moved to Westwood because of the known school system. So we have to think of that. Thank you. I'll also add that when students or families make the decision to send their kids to private school, um, to St. Catharines or to Blue Hills, they take their state aid with them. So um, Blue Hills Tech actually um, presented to FinCom a couple weeks ago and they estimate 15 to 20 maybe students would leave Norwood High if the override fails, and if that is the case, they would take all of their state aid with them, um, and we would have even more of a deficit. The same thing happens if students go to a, 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 other private schools. Right, because Blue Hills will still have sports programs next year, unlike a high school. High school will be losing the sport, all the sports programs, as well as the marching band and all of the theater and arts programs. I think Maya was going to. Oh, cool. I, we can take a question. Oh, what happened to all the revenue from the busing? My kids are late '80s graduates. We never paid for busing. We didn't pay for uniforms. We didn't pay to join sports. Now you have to pay for all that stuff. We absolutely. What does that money go to? It, it offsets the cost of busing. It, we were discussing busing last night at the school committee meeting. The new busing contract has come in for. Um, the bids for next year. We expect busing, not special education busing, the regular student buses. We expect that to cost about a million dollars next year, but we do collect um, we do collect bus fees. Yeah. That offsets it by about $200,000. So it helps us in our budget. We have had to institute fees in order to avoid making even more drastic cuts, but it doesn't completely pay for those services. But I will tell you that the fees have a huge impact on families. I personally have two students at the high school. Both of my kids are athletes, and one of them rides the bus. This year alone, I wrote checks for $1,100 for fees for Norwood schools. It's $200 a season per kid to play sports with a family cap of $800. So I hit the family cap of $800, and then the bus fee for my son was $300. My daughter drives to school. She actually also had to pay a parking fee, um, but that actually doesn't come into our uh, directly into our budget. That's a, a separate thing. But eleven hundred dollars out of my pocket to to support things that, as you said, used to be covered in the budget. But over the years, we, like a lot of other school districts, have found that our costs are just exceeding our income, and we have had to find other sources of income. So. And this is, again, this is not a problem that is specific to Norwood. All of the towns and cities in Massachusetts are dealing with this and have tried to address it through raising taxes and operational override. 
So I'm not sure Norwood could ever be immune to that to those problems. At some point, we need to address it. Um, we were. Um, we also brought Mr. Griffin with us, and um, we were hoping he could speak to kind of what has changed um, in the last ten or however many years. You want to go back? Thank you. Um, I started teaching at the Callahan School in 1969, and I left there in 2017. Uh, I spent my life at the Callahan School, and I've seen lots of changes. Um, 26 years as a principal, almost every year we would meet, and and we would be told so many millions of dollars have to go. And to, there were some statements earlier that um, you always threaten, you always threaten, but. What we did was through attrition, we just didn't replace people. And as they went, uh, what used to be a, a, a two custodian or a three custodian deal became a 1.5 custodian deal and we moved one around, around town if we had to. Um, each and every year, the teachers are getting a, a raise that's, that's two or two and a half percent. There's, there's talk around town that they're, they're getting all this money and raises. The biggest raise I've seen from a teacher in the last 15 years is 3%. It's usually 2% with another 1% maybe in January so that it's not another full percent. But they're not making they're not making the big money that you think. If you compare our town to the towns in, in, in the, say the leagues that we were in, whether it was the Bay State or the Tri-Valley, we were always on the, either the second to last paying or the bottom paying. Um, so I, I don't know where that's coming from, but they are not <laughs> They are not pocketing a lot of money for the, for that. This is this is a real thing, and um, and we're, we're giving the kids what they need, but we can't control sometimes what their needs are because their kids come into town with a special need, physical or otherwise. We must take care of that child. If that child needs to be driven to Natick every single day by a Norwood van, then we, we help, we'll drive that kid to Natick every single day in the van. If the kid need, if the kid is uh, hard of hearing or if the child is blind, then it is uh, incumbent upon us to take care of those children and to, and, and to pay so that, be, because they are under the law entitled to their education as well. So there are unforeseen circumstances that occur on a regular basis. But there's nobody, there's nobody in that system that's spending a lot of money or making a lot of raises. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have for me or from a, from a principal's point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, before we wrap up, oh, in the back. Um, I would like to ask what the town could do to sa save some money. And um, is this on? Yeah, uh, talk really close to it. Oh, okay. I'd like to ask what the town can do to kind of save some money. And one of the things, and I mean, it's just small things, but these things have a way of adding up. I live just behind the junior high school. And often I'm stuck on Wa Washington Street with the buses coming out of school after school is over. And I can count on some buses, two children, the next bus maybe have six, the next bus might be filled, and then the next bus might have 12. Um, I think just saving some of the bus, buses coming and make, making the routes longer or, or something, but to get a bus to leave the school with four, four kids or two kids and they do their whole route and that's it, um, the other thing I noticed, and this might be a state thing other than a town thing, it's the policemen who do these duties. You know, they, they get these excess duties to watch the man digging a hole in the, in the road. And the police are standing there with their coffee, watching the man. Not everybody, I'm just, you know, it's a waste. It's a big waste of money because they get big, big bucks for that. And some of the policemen are already retired and yeah, still getting. That's a killer. That's a killer. Why is this? Alan, that's a yeah, good question. Um, there's a couple of questions you have. I mean, the last one you had are the police details. Those are not paid for by the community. Those are paid for by the contractor. 
the person uh, responsible or the group uh, responsible for the construction, well, it, whether it's an individual contract or whether it's national grid or whatever. So that is not a town expense. But contractors have gone against this and have been told no. Unfortunately, that's 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 been a long-standing issue uh, with with communities. Uh, it is a state law. Uh, <coughs> on almost every instance where some type of traffic control is needed, you need uh, you need an officer uh, there. So it isn't something number one the town can control, but number two, it's not a town cost anyway. In terms of savings, I mean, I can't speak to the buses. Maya would be willing to do that. But I know one of the things we're looking at uh, in town is consolidating a number of town and school services. You know, you've heard people talking about a consolidated facilities department. Uh, you know, many communities do that. We think it's a good idea. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get that uh, done within the next year or so because you may not save money in year one. But down the road, you will, because it'll be much more efficient. You get a better use of personnel, get a better use of equipment. And it, 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 other communities, again, have demonstrated that that's a great idea. There are other town departments where, and school departments where you could do the same thing, whether it's accounting, whether it's information technology, whether it's human resources. But you know, we want to get, we want to start first with human resource, with uh, excuse me, with facilities department, and then we'll try to get to the others uh, as they come. But that's you know one way we think we could have a greater efficiency and savings down the road. I did want to answer the question about the buses. I certainly understand that it's best if we can optimize the use of our buses. If anyone was watching the school committee meeting last night, we were discussing the contract for the new buses, the new bus contract, and uh, we were explaining how part of that contract we requested um, that we have access to routing software that will make it easier for us to look at all the distribution of students across the town and automatically optimize those routes. We've had 13 buses running the same routes in town for as long as I can remember. I, my daughter's a senior in high school this year. I think they were the same when she was in kindergarten. And, and the distribution of students across town has changed since then, so we are aware of that. But the other thing I would caution you is that um, we sometimes, I know people tend to see the afternoon buses because the middle school buses, the early morning buses, and middle school starts at 7.25 a.m. So those buses are already gone from the middle school by 7.15. You have to be up pretty early to see those buses running. But what happens at the middle school is it tends to be that the morning buses are more busy than the afternoon buses. Currently, the middle school is running a very robust after-school program. We have after-school sports, we have after-school clubs, and we do run a late bus. So there are quite a few students who may be on the bus in the morning and then are not riding the afternoon bus that leaves at 2, which is not to deny that there are problems with optimizing the buses, and we absolutely are trying to address that. But um, I will just say that sometimes it's hard to tell based on the afternoon bus how many kids are riding in the morning. And um, as far, I think you also mentioned just savings. Um, Bill or Ellen, would you guys like to speak to the stabilization account and how um, the override would include funds just to make the override last longer? Yeah, but uh, I was gonna make a comment before we uh, broke up here that this is a, a strategic plan that the three major boards in town and our administrators put together to ask for several years into the future we keep referencing five because it may not be uh, really sensible to try to project out farther than that and to be able to give a guarantee but we're certain that we can make this work for the next five years if not longer we think longer but at least for the next five years where we talked about earlier in the day uh, the meeting here today that you know why do we hear every year that you know we're going to have cuts and how bad things are. Hopefully for the next five years with the override passes, we're going to reset where we are, what our needs are, and we have built in their projections so that we can solve all those problems for at least the next five years. We won't hear any of that grumbling. We'll have our budget set. The stabilization uh, part of the override is to set up a stabilization fund, 
and that is a savings account that will give us a good infusion of cash that will be there to make sure that we can keep that commitment and not have to come back to you and not have to cry that we have to cut up cut services that we can keep them at the same level that we have as we set this budget for the coming fiscal year it also is a help to us in that when we have to we talked about that there's going to be a need for a new middle school and that there will be a big expense to borrowing because that will be something we're borrowing a debt service on that the interest rate that we have to pay on that will be determined by bond council and bond council looks at the town's financial stability the security how much cash it has on hand and this will help guarantee that we can keep our bond rating up and it doesn't drop therefore we'll save on long-term borrowing costs so it gives the town financial stability it gives the town the resources it needs to make sure that we can make this plan go for five years so that you know we don't have to see any reduction in services thank you just one question <clears throat> uh, people saying that uh, the way to cut, I don't know too much about it, but the circuit breaker, I don't know if everybody is aware, but people should check into it. It's a possibility that could be helpful to them. And that's listed, the information and contact information is listed on the back of this handout that we have that has um, different tax assistance programs. And I would just really encourage people to look for the assistance if you need it. There's no shame in asking for the help if it's there. There are programs in place to help those who need it. And I don't think a lot of seniors are taking advantage of, of the programs that are in place. Any other questions before we wrap up? Thank you all um, for your time. Thank you for coming out. And uh, thank you for all of your questions.